Our final topic in the study of all pairs, shortest paths, algorithms, will be Floyd Warshaw. Uh, this is a better choice than Johnson's algorithm if you have dense graphs and you prefer simple code. It works on matrix representations. We'll have a few comments on other matrix approaches as well. And we're continuing here at Pearl and Hermes Atoll in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Floyd Warshaw and related algorithms will use an adjacency matrix W to uh, represent the graphs. Uh, it's going to be a series of en entries W, I, J. And it's going to be an N by N matrix where N is, is the number of vertices. So each weight will be defined as follows. Zero if I equal J costs nothing to get to yourself. Whatever the weight function assigns if I is not equal to J and uh, that edge is an E and infinite otherwise. So we'll be working mainly with this W matrix, but we're also going to construct a D matrix, which is also uh, N by N. And this will have the distances between all pairs of vertices. We also use a predecessor matrix, pi, that's big pi, and it's constructed of entries little pi, i, j, where each of these entries is the uh, predecessor of j under a shortest path from i to j. When we develop the uh, floyd warshaw algorithm, we're not going to talk about pi explicitly, but it can be easily modified to be updated in parallel to updating d. Before we discuss floyd warshaw I want to just make you aware of a, a related approach, which is of interest partly because it shows the relationship of shortest paths algorithms to uh, matrix multiplication and partly because it makes an important point about dynamic programming. Dynamic programming applies here. We know that uh, shortest paths have optimal substructure, meaning if you find a shortest path between two vertices, all the subpaths between uh, the start vertex and the inter some intermediate vertex on the way and that intermediate vertex and the end vertex must also be shortest paths because otherwise by a cut and paste argument you could find a contradiction. You could replace a non-shortest path that's a subpath of the overall shortest path with one that is a shortest path and get a cheaper overall shortest path. So we have optimal substructure but often we'll find with dynamic programming problems knowing that there's optimal substructure does not necessarily tell you exactly how to break it down. There may be different recursive ways to break down a problem. Here we're going to look at a different way of breaking it down than Floyd Warshall to make that point. Uh, so let's say we have a vertex i and vertex j, and there's some shortest path between it, between them, p. By optimal substructure, if there's an intermediate vertex k along the way, where k is one edge, one link away from j, in other words, k j, that edge is in e then this path here must also be a shortest path. So this decomposition of taking off one link at the end suggests one approach to solving the problem. And that's to find all shortest paths between i and j, first of all of length 0, which of course is where i is equal to j. That would be of length 0. Now find all shortest paths between i and j that take exactly one edge. And that's ex those are all expressed already in the matrix W. You know, W says what the edges are between I and J. Now let's find all shortest paths between I and J that go through a path of length 2 before we take that final hop to J, and so on. So in general, we're going to ask, uh, if we have a shortest path from I to some K, can we extend that one more hop to get a shortest path from I directly to J, or is it cheaper just to go directly to I to J without going through K? So in recursively characterizing the value of a shortest path, remember that's one of the steps in developing dynamic programming, we can have uh, an expression that will look something like this, ask for the minimum of does it cost less to go directly from I to J with the um, path of the number of edges we've got so far, or is it cheaper to add one more edge to our path? Go from I to K, that's a path, plus the edge, the weight on the single edge, the one up here uh, from K to J. And then we just keep repeating. Essentially, we're adding an edge on 
uh, we're making the in terms of number of edges the shortest paths longer to see if they're shorter in terms of weights as we make them longer that way in these motivations the textbook develops in an algorithm called extend shortest paths and it turns out that this algorithm has exactly the same structure although different operations as matrix multiplication and this is because it parallels the operation of repeatedly multiplying a matrix by itself so we had W here if we start with W that's giving you all the shortest paths that involve just one edge in the path and then when you call extend shortest paths you uh, it's equivalent to multiplying it by itself and you get W squared and so now we have all the shortest paths of length 2 and now if we take W squared and multiply it by W you get W cubed and now we have all shortest paths of length 3 and so on now since a uh, path in, in a graph can be up to length of the number of vertices up to n you would have to do this operation n times and it turns out that the cost for doing it this way is it's big O of n cubed which is the same as the cost of multiplying an n by n matrix to do one of these multiplications here but we have to do big O of n of them to get paths of length n to get the exponent all the way up to um, you know w to the n essentially uh, so we end up having to pay the cost of big O of n to the fourth pull it off which isn't very efficient but how can we fix that we can actually make this better so let me set this aside over here this is the cost to do it this way uh, we can now observe that matrix multiplication is associative and we can do what's called repeated squaring so this is where the repeated squaring comes in so instead of it doing it this way we can use the fact that matrix multiplication is associative so after we've done w times w is w squared instead of multiplying it just by w again we can say well let's multiply w squared times w squared and then uh, that gives you w to the fourth and if you do w fourth times w to the fourth that gives you w to the eighth and so on so we started like here we started with w times w is equal to w squared but if you look now here we only have to do this log n times to get the exponent greater than n and it turns out that if you continue to multiply after you've gotten all the, the longest um, the paths of the most edges it doesn't change the result so it doesn't matter if you overshoot uh, but th this is log n the multiplications so over here we had uh, order of n cube multiplications we had to do n of them so we got n to the fourth over here we get order of n cubed multiplications but we only have to do log n of them so that's more efficient than that but returning to my previous point about different ways of doing dynamic programming we can even do better than this because here we kind of restricted ourselves to taking a full path and extending it by just one length one link but what if we're more flexible what if we said between i and j we can either just go directly or we can go via a whole this is a path and another path and so we have this choice and this will be more flexible uh, so that's actually what Floyd Warshals does we'll just have a little comic relief here here Kyle is trying to replace these old um, temperature sensors that record temperature for up to two years with some new ones and then he comes under attack by an Alua who then turns around and attacks the photographer the approach we just looked at builds up the small problems are finding shortest paths from each I to J involving only one edge and then involving one or two edges and then involving one or three edges Floyd Warshaw is going to differ uh, it's going to first start by finding short, shortest paths that just go directly then it'll find shortest paths between I and J that either go directly or via vertex 1 so we're going to assume that the vertex set is a numbered set of integers from 1 to n so then it'll find all the shortest paths from i to j that either go directly or via vertex 1 and 2 and then it'll find shortest paths that are either direct or via vertex 1 and 2 and 3 and so on 
up through shortest paths that go either directly or via vertices 1, 2, dot, 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 up to k. Or let's say k minus 1 for the next step we're about to take. So importantly, each of these steps, we can use the results of the previous steps. Uh, so for example, let's say we found all the shortest paths between i and between each i and j that involves intermediate vertices 1, 2 to k minus 1. So now we've got i here, and we've got j here. And now we can ask, if we throw in k, you know, previously we hadn't considered k, we now throw in k, can we get a shorter path by doing it this way? rather than going direct, not involving k. So this is the path involving 1 through k minus 1. And here we want to ask if we allow k to be included in the path, will that make it cheaper? Now you may remember from just a few minutes ago, you know, I said the, there was this min expression. So at each step we're asking, uh, is it cheaper to go uh, what we have so far, the distance we have so far from i to j, or is it cheaper to go from i to k plus, and here with the previous approach I wrote a single link, but here we're, we're going to write another path, k, j. So this is why this approach is more flexible than the one I presented to you previously. It's going to allow us to combine different combinations of paths. These observations lead us to the classic floyd warshall algorithm. Here I'm presenting a simplified version. In the text they develop a version that makes copies of matrices and then in an exercise they say well we don't really have to make copies and so this is the um, actually the original simplified version of the algorithm uh, we give it a weight matrix w and um, then we uh, find out how many rows it has or how many vertices and then we make a uh, distance vertex which will be a copy of w and now notice that this d at this point is giving us all the shortest paths from i to j that don't involve any intermediate vertices. That's exactly what the, adja the adjacency matrix is. You know, for each pair i, j of, of vertices, do they have a direct link between them? So this is without any k's as intermediate. And now we start stepping through all the k's as intermediate. We're going to uh, start throwing them in here. Uh, so for every, for every k, we're going to start with vertex 1, and then vertex 2 will be thrown in the mix, and then vertex 3. We're going to ask. For every pair of i, j, is it cheaper? Can we update the current distance estimate, um, which is also here? Is it cheaper to keep with what we had before, or which is this path right here? That's what we had before, getting from i to j without k being involved. Or is it cheaper to go via k, which is these two paths here? So here's the uh, d i k is this, and the d k j is this, and so. We just update that. If you want to have uh, pi, the um, you know the uh, the matrix of uh, predecessors, then when instead of just having this one line here, you would test is it less than rather than using min. And if it is less than, you would also update uh, pi to show the predecessors. And so you do this uh, every time you add a new k as the intermediary, you update it all, for all pairs i j. What's their new updated distance and possibly pi uh, until k reaches n, in which case we have put in all possible intermediate vertices in the paths, and so we must be done. And then we return d. d is being updated all along the way to um, have the, um, the distance. The, so at the end, it's got the actual the, uh, the delta of ij for all, you know, all ij in a um, set of vertices. Okay. Now, what's the big O, or actually theta, of this? It should be obvious. I shouldn't have to tell you. Take a look at it. Um, just note that it is better than the previous algorithm I talked about, which was n cubed log n. And note also the code is very tight. There's very little overhead, unlike um, Johnson's algorithm, where we had to throw in augmenting data structures and run a couple of different algorithms. Very simple, very tight. It is faster than Johnson's on dense graphs, but Johnson's is better for sparse graphs. And Johnson's, you can work with adjacency lists. This requires a matrix and the full space, um, you know, the v squared space for the matrix. Meanwhile, at Pearl and Hermes, a huge thunderstorm has engulfed us in driving rain and lightning. 
So let's look at an example here. It's a very simple algorithm, but it's very complex to trace it out because of all the nested loops. Uh, so here we have an initial matrix. D of 0 is the state of, is actually W, the, the adjacency matrix as it was given. And the 0 indicates it, that it gives all the shortest paths between I and J not going through anything. Now we're going to construct all the shortest paths between I and J only going through vertex 1 or not going through anything. Uh, so this is going to be the k equal 1 pass. Okay? So what we're asking here is for each i, j, is it cheaper to go direct? Uh, for example, 1, 1. Well, we're not going to deal with that because that's just to itself. Where for 1, 2, is it cheaper to go direct? From 1 to 2, it costs 3. Or is it cheaper to go via vertex 1? Well, vertex 1 is already involved. So actually, this whole role is not going to change, as you can see here. Uh, because we were already starting at 1, so it's not any cheaper to go through 1. We're already starting at 1. So let's look at 2. Is it cheaper to go direct from 2 to each of these other vertices, or is it cheaper to go from 2 to 1 first? And so this loop's going to run through and check them all, but none of them are going to work because 2 to 1 is infinite, so that's not going to improve on any of these costs. And similarly for 3, it's going to run you know, this is the, this is in the i j looping. You know, i is now three. J is going to run through all these, but it's not going to be any cheaper because it costs more to go th through one than it does through anything else. But then with four, we have a promising situation. Is it cheaper to go direct from four to other vertices like four to one, or is it cheaper to go via one? Well, of course, one is already on that path, so that doesn't work there. But what about two? Is it cheaper to go direct from four to two? Well, that's infinite. Or how about via vertex 1? Well, 4 to vertex 1 costs 2. And then you go up here and you say 1 to vertex 2 costs 3. And so 2 plus 3 is 5. And that's how we got this 5 here. And that's also how this nil got updated to this 1, saying, OK, 4's uh, path is now going via 1. 4's path to 2 uh, is now going via 1. And you continue that kind of processing through the rest of the row here. For example, here's another one. Uh, is it cheaper to go 4 to 5 direct? That's infinite. Or 4 to 1, which is 2, and 1 to 5, which is negative 4. And that gives us the negative 2 and says, yeah, we got to go through 1. Now let's look at k equal 2. And I've added some more indices here because it's easier to keep track. So now we are now iterating through all the, the i's, or the rows, the j's, the columns again, but now we're asking for, we're constructing the matrix for k equals 2 using this as the current state of things and asking if we throw in vertex 2, is it cheaper? So is it cheaper to go from, well, 1 to 1, we'll skip that. If it, is it cheaper to go from 1 to 2 via 2? Well, it's already there. Is it cheaper to go from 1 to 3 via 2? Well, 1 to 3 costs 8. 1 to 2 costs 3. But 2 to 3 costs infinite. So no, it's not cheaper. That does not change. What about from 1 to 4? Well, 1 to 4 is infinite. But if we go via 2, 1 to 2 costs 3. And 2 to 4 costs 1. So that's going to give us a cost of 4. And so this is going to say, yeah, we're going to do that via 2. Now, 1 to 5 is negative 4. Uh, but if we go via 2, 1 to 2 is 3. And 3 to 5 is infinite. So that doesn't work. And so you just continue in that manner all the way through. You're going to get to do one of these on your homework, so you will get a good feel for it. It's pretty tedious, but it is simple and guaranteed to work. Finally, I want to note one more thing. Uh, notice that in the original matrix, for example, there was no direct link from 1 to 4, but eventually we found that there was a path from 1 to 4. And so if we take the infinite values to mean there is no path, and any numerical value other than infinite to mean there is a path. When you finish this process, you've computed the transitive closure of the graph. The transitive closure is the closure of all the possible paths. It, it tells you which ver vertices are reachable from other vertices. And so if you only care about transitive closure, you don't care about the actual path length or cost. Well, we can either do it at, without modifying the algorithm and just see where infinite costs turn into non-infinite costs. That means there's closure. Or you can actually just uh, use zeros and ones, Boolean values, one for connected, zero for not connected, and then modify Flora de Warshall to use or instead of min and and instead of addition. And that will reduce the space requirements for storing a large graph because it's now just zeros and ones instead of numbers, instead of um, potentially real numbers. And also, um, on some machines, Boolean operations are faster.
So that concludes our study of all pairs shortest paths, including the Floyd-Warshall dynamic programming approach.